Okay, thank you. So indeed, I have a rather uh, dramatic title, as you can tell, especially since we heard from Nakahara-san earlier about the history of, of galactic supernovas and nearby supernovas. So I am boldly calling this title, Observing Supernova Neutrinos Within the Next Three Years, exclamation point. I like exclamation points. You will see a few others before we're done. So uh, if you wanted to make a neutrino bomb for some reason, uh, the best way you can possibly imagine to do it is a core collapse supernova. I mean, these are nature's ideal neutrino generators. So when a supernova, a core collapse type supernova, not the type 1A we heard about before, but when a core collapse supernova explodes, it releases most of its energy, 98, 99%, as neutrinos. And that's a good thing for us because I don't think we would be alive today if much more of the energy went into the shock wave. So when a supernova explodes, the amount of energy that's released, you know, we hear these numbers, 3 times 10 to the 53 ergs or whatever. You know, what is that? Well, to try to make it a little bit more comprehensible, imagine you had Ichicho 10 to the 12, 1 trillion hydrogen bombs. And you set those bombs off in the space of one second. Ichicho hydrogen bombs, 1 trillion hydrogen bombs. In the space of one second. And you did that every second from the beginning of the Big Bang to today. Boom, boom, boom. That's the energy release of one core collapse supernova. And luckily, that all goes into neutrinos, the first approximation. Because as it is, it's pretty dangerous to be near one of these things. And if much more of the energy went into the shock wave, we probably wouldn't be here. At any rate, so neutrinos and gravitational waves are really the only way you can look inside a star as it's dying. So they're rather interesting things, and now, of course, as of a few hours ago, we were officially into the age of multi-messenger astronomy. So although we've looked for neutrinos for this, uh, this event, by the way, that was announced earlier today, uh, the odds are extraordinarily low we'll get any, and I don't expect we will be announcing anything about that this time. Okay, so... Um, You've actually seen a couple of these pictures twice already, and here's the third time. So this is the world sample of supernova neutrino events. And uh, in fact, the, the, uh, the Boxon events, the five events from Boxon were rather controversial for many years, but we kind of made peace and did a big hug with the groups of the 20th anniversary of 87A celebration. So now we put them all on one plot. So it's about 24, 25 events. And uh, this is time in seconds, 0 to 13. This is energy, and that's it. That is the world sample of supernova neutrino events, all from that one explosion back in 1987. On average, there has been one theory paper written every 10 days for the last 30 years based on this data set, that data set alone. So this is one of the most picked over data sets in the world. People have really argued about it. It's because the energy spectra are a little disjoint between the experiments, and there's just things to worry about. But at any rate, it certainly confirmed the basic idea that core collapses make a lot of neutrinos. Uh, here are actual event displays, both from IMB and Kamioka, the, uh, Kamiokande. These are more or less to scale, uh, size-wise. Uh, IMB was a big square-shaped thing, a cubic thing in the US, and uh, Kamiokande, of course, was the predecessor to Super Kamiokande. You see these rings here, and that's will be relevant later. So you get this ring, ring. This was a higher energy event, so the ring was better defined. OK, so that's, those are two out of our 20, 24 events. So now, Super K is running. It's been running for quite some time. We had the uh, 20th anniversary celebration last year of Super K. And it's a joint ICRR, IPMU, plus some international collaborators uh, project. Uh, here I say for political reasons that it's one of the best and most successful neutrino and proton decay detection in the world. I personally believe it is the best <laughs> in the world, but okay. Some people might take issue. Of course, it's 50 kilotons of water, about 13,000 phototubes, a kilometer underground uh, in Kamioka at the IPMU satellite in Kamioka. So I've been part of this from the early, early days. Uh, this is the very rarely seen outer detector. You always see these pictures of the dramatic inner detector in Super K. But there's a veto region here with little tubes salvaged from IMB. So these have already seen one supernova. Anyway, this little veto region here, about two meters wide, 
and uh, that's on the other side of these tubes. But I show this picture in part to emphasize that whenever you know there's going to be a group photo taken, you should wear a bright shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Okay, so we've been going for years and years. As Nakahara-san said, Super K is ready and waiting for the next galactic supernova. We will let people know that the light is on its way, the neutrinos should get here first. They're made first. Um, and that's where we stand. We, we work very, very hard to keep the uptime of Super K high. We try to keep it around 99%. So, okay. But of course, we would very much like to see some more supernova neutrinos. It's been 30 years. And there are, you know, there's, there's uh, some, some uh, complications there. You know, number one, it's been over 30 years since 87A. And today, I don't know if anybody knows, but today is an anniversary. Today is the 413th anniversary to the day of when Kepler started observing so-called his supernova, which is probably a type 1A and didn't make a lot of neutrinos. But okay, anyway, uh, so it's been a long time since a supernova was in our galaxy, at least one that was definitively observed. There have surely been others that were obscured, but in terms of observations, that's it. That's the last one, 413 years ago. So that's a bit of a drag. And uh, so, you know, you could say it's been a long, cold winter for supernova neutrinos, 30 years. But I am here to tell you, I'm here to testify that there is hope. There is hope, brothers and sisters. So how can we be certain to see some more supernova neutrinos without having to wait too long. And the problem about waiting too long is summarized by this little cartoon. You know, if you have to wait too long, you, you know, face death. <laughs> you don't want to wait 413 years. And it's no fun to be this guy, and I don't think this guy's having much fun either. So at any rate, we want to get rid of this annoying wait. So luckily, this is not the view of most supernovas. This is, of course, an artist's rendering. You'll notice that the planet that the observer is sitting on disappears in the final frames, and that's because, indeed, that's what happens. If you're within 100 light years of a supernova, game over, man. I mean, it, it sterilizes space, destroys planets. It's, <laughs> you don't want to be anywhere near one. And that's why I mentioned before, we're lucky that 99% of the energy doesn't go into the shock wave. So 1% of the shock wave is sterilizing. 1% of the energy sterilizes that volume of space. By the way, type 1As, if you're looking down the barrel, they can kill you about 1,000 light years away. So, okay. So this isn't what most supernovas look like to us, which is a good thing. Most of them look like this. So the video here is a loop. This is not a pulsar. This is a supernova in a distant galaxy going off, growing, and fading. And there, and there, and there, and there. So this is what they look like. We see these little pops going on all the time. And we're really seeing many, many, many supernovas now. Well, we've got these good all-sky surveys like Assassin that are spotting many, many things. So there are thousands of supernova explosions in the universe every hour. It's almost one a second. Um, somewhere in the universe. And because of 87A, we're quite certain that these are producing neutrinos when they explode. So this diffuse gas of supernova neutrinos suffuses the universe. They haven't been detected yet. Uh, so these are called the diffuse supernova neutrino background, DSNB. Sometimes they're called the supernova relic neutrinos, SRN. Uh, these are not the Big Bang relic neutrinos. That's a whole different story. But anyway, these are the, this is the DSNB, and this is made by supernovas. So, before the founding of IPMU, but very much in the spirit of IPMU, of bringing theorists and experimentalists together, my theorist friend John Beacom and I sat down. I'm very much an experimentalist. We sat down, as you'll tell later. Anyway, we sat down and we wrote this paper specifically trying to get these supernova neutrinos. And we modestly called this thing Gadzooks, Gadolinium Antineutrino Detectors, zealously outperforming old Kamiokande. Super! Exclamation point. I like exclamation points. Uh, so basically what we said was, let's, let's take a big water trank up detector, and Super-K is really the only working model of a large water trank up detector in the world, so we talked about Super-K. Let's load it with water-soluble gadolinium, 
gadolinium is not water soluble, but you make a compound that is. And then you can get all sorts of physics benefits. So this paper evaluated all that. And uh, it's doing OK. We've got a citation every 15 days for 13 years. That's not bad for a proposal with no data. So anyway, that was Gadzooks. Some of you might be saying, gadolinium? Well, gadolinium, what the hell is that one? You know, I don't remember gadolinium. So here is the very rarely shown accurate way to write the periodic chart. I like this much better than when they draw the lanthanides out here as a separate block, because that's misleading. This is really what it looks like. You've got these rare guys in here, and they are a new family. You see the steps here. OK, so gadolinium is this guy down here, element 64. Remember the Beatles song, When I'm 64. Now you'll always remember gadolinium is element 64. OK? And so gadolinium is like all of these, uh, these rare earths, is a silvery metal with very odd properties. Gadolinium has especially odd properties. It's got odd properties due to its electron shell and its nucleus, and it's a really weird, really weird element for many, many reasons. But it has only a very few uses. It's been used for data storage, for coding uh, optical drives, writable optical drives, hard disks. The most famous use is in MRI imaging. You get injected with gadolinium to, do, to contrast stuff in your body. So if any of you have had an MRI scan, you've probably had some of it injected into you. And finally, it's used to make a nice green color in flat screen TVs. So that's what it's used for. Uh, as I say, it has many weird properties. Its Curie point where it changes from ferromagnetic to paramagnetic is at room temperature, which is very odd. It's the only element like that. And, uh, it, but the thing that we care about is that it loves to eat neutrons. There is nothing else in this world that eats neutrons more aggressively than gadolinium. And the natural form of gadolinium, you don't have to do isotopic separation. If you just dig it up, get it out of the ground, purify it, that loves to eat neutrons like nothing else. So the idea is you dissolve a bunch of gadolinium salt, so gadolinium chloride, gadolinium sulfate, whatever, into your water, the gadolinium floats around, and then when an, a new E-bar comes in, this is the dominant reaction for supernova neutrinos. We believe that all of those events in Kamiokande and IMB were new E-bar events. When one of those comes in, you see the positron, that ring that I showed you in those event displays, that nice ring. Okay, but there's also a neutron that comes out. That's what happens to them. A proton, after all. So it turns into a neutron, it bumbles around in the water, gets thermalized. Eventually, it sticks to a proton, makes a deuteron, and a little flash of light, which is basically impossible to see in super K, certainly with any efficiency. It's just below threshold. It's 2 MeV. It's way too low. However, if you add gadolinium, if you add about 0.1% gadolinium by mass into the water, then 90% of the time, this gadolinium will grab the neutron before a proton can get it. So 0.1%, one thousandth, competes admirably. So that's the idea. So then the new bars can be identified on an event-by-event -event basis by this delayed coincidence, and this forms what we call the gadolinium heartbeat. Within 50 centimeters, and by the way, the event reconstruction, the event reconstruction resolution in super K is a, about half a meter, so within the same voxel, and 30 microseconds apart, you get this boom, 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 these double pulses. And there's nothing else that can do that except inverse beta decay. So that's the idea. You dump the stuff in. You know, super K is really quite quiet. In a cubic meter of super K's volume, we only have three events per year that look like neutrinos after all background cuts are applied. Most of those are not neutrinos. There's still a lot of background. But if you've got three events per cubic meter per year, you can see that two events within a cubic meter per 30 microseconds is a pretty powerful background cutting technique. OK, so SuperK has looked for these DSNB uh, neutrinos before. The latest paper we put out was in 2012. And uh, the best relic fit is negative. So we, we are overwhelmed by these backgrounds here. So this tagging of. Uh, approach will allow us to really wipe out those backgrounds. And we expect every two, three years, we should collect an 87A-like sample of these neutrinos in perpetuity. So that's nice. 
This is from the Gadzooks paper. This is what the various coincidence signals look like in a GD-loaded super K. By the way, the most modern DSNB range is this green line now. But at any rate, so you've got this big hump from reactors. You've got what's left over from the atmospheric neutrinos. And then you've got this nice little window here where things are pretty much free. Well, indeed. So this plot was made in 2003, and this had all of Japan's reactors on. When you turn off all of Japan's reactors, this line is chopped by a factor of 97%, so 30 times smaller. But the problem is, you'll note, that due to this log scale, even if you put this hump down here, this line only shifts to the left maybe an MeV or two. It doesn't really open the window very much. Um, well, indeed, because we will be measuring this, this shape, and the reactors we'll be measuring will be in Korea. And I don't say South Korea. <laughs> so that's interesting. And that's a new point, by the way, on the reactor distance plot. We've never measured things from 800, meters, 800 kilometers away from reactors, and this will do that for sure. So it is interesting. OK, so we expect a few clean events per year, and that's the, that's the situation. So moving on. So uh, Nakahara-san showed a version of this plot. This is a slightly different, uh, different uh, treatment of it. But at any rate, so based on the 87A data, if you look at the, uh, the neutrino temperature and the energy of the new E bars, you've got this region that IMB says is where it should be in this Kamiokande region. And you can see they're a little disjoint. They do overlap, but this area here is excluded by super K not seeing any relics so far. We put gadolinium in super K, we run for six years, and this is our discovery potential, shaded. So this is a strong technique. This should really allow us to say something. And OK, so there we go. And you saw, if you were really paying attention, you saw this plot uh, once before today. But at any rate, there are many advantages to putting gadolinium into super K in the case of a galactic supernova. Of course, we'll see these, these DSNB things. But in the case of a galactic supernova, having this tagging is spectacular. You get all sorts of benefits. So because the Nui bars are tagged individually, they're not mixed in with the other species, only they get a tag, you get their exact energy spectrum, time structure, all of that is determined beautifully. Uh, because of that GD heartbeat boop, 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 that starts going off in your detector, you know instantly that it's a supernova. There's nothing else that's going to make a thousand of those heartbeats in a second. Uh, by doing the subtraction, by taking away all these tagged events, the directional elastic scatters, which I didn't mention, but they're 3% of the events, they really, it really cleans up, and you point back to the supernova much more accurately, just because you're not sitting on a background. Cuts your error circle in the sky by 75%. Uh, again, the new E bars are tagged, so you can see more subtle signals, especially the neutronization burst signals of new E's, much better. You can look for really late black hole formation, because you've got to drop, you, as, until you drop below the background rate, you can look for this the stop, stoppage of the neutrino signal when the event horizon eats the neutrino sphere. So that can go way out. And then finally, one of the neatest tricks is because the last stage of fusion, silicon burning into iron, the temperature inside the star is above inverse beta threshold. So the neutrino antineutrino pairs that stream out during that period are just barely detectable in a gadolinium loaded super K, and they can make inverse beta events. Quite often, the positron will be invisible, but just that increase in neutron singles should be very dramatic. And I direct you to a poster from my student, Charles Simpson. Charles Simpson, by the way, is in the first cohort of the, this new program that we have here at IPMU the IPMU Oxford Graduate Scholars. It's an agreement between the two institutes. They take their first year of classes at Oxford, then they come here and they do research for two years. Anyway, so neutron tagging will help us with all kinds of other things too. 
proton decay, atmospheric solar, all kinds of stuff. So John and I didn't just want to propose this, we wanted to make this work. Uh, this is Alex Kosenko, took a nice picture at Snowbird. This is a real photo, not Photoshop. Gadzooks is a black diamond. Anybody who skis knows what that means. It's not the easiest path. So, you know, we had to do a whole lot of studies to make sure we weren't going to have a problem. Uh, you know, all kinds of materials, science stuff, and filtration and all that. And so, by the way, I made a couple of very quick discoveries about gadolinium right after proposing this idea. So I was really excited. I bought a bunch of gadolinium from China, threw some in my suitcase, and went to the airport. Now, the two discoveries I made were as follows. Number one, gadolinium chloride is opaque to x-rays. <laughs> and number two, whoops, that's not good. Number two, they get really mad at the airport when they find a kilogram of white powder in your carry-on <laughs> luggage. There were so many guns, automatic weapons. And finally, I should say, if this ever happens to you, it could, right? Don't say the following thing to the guy with the biggest gun who's pointed at you. Don't open that, it's really pure. <laughs> so I was taken into custody. <laughs> yeah. It was unfortunate. At any rate, eventually I escaped and I'm here today to tell you how things went. So the basic trick is we got to filter the water, keep the gadolinium in the water, not remove the gadolinium. So that required a new technology called molecular bandfast filtration. It's a bunch of filters. It's very plumbing -y and it's, it's okay, but it works. Uh, we keep the gadolinium in solution. You know, here's, here's the Escher print working, by the way. There's a little gadolinium canoe going around and around, not being removed. And this supports a number of technologies. So I'm talking about supernova neutrino and proton decay, but it also helps with, and Hitoshi was kind of hinting at this, remote detection of fissile material production, hidden nuclear reactors across borders. You can actually, there's a whole other program that is a separate talk that I can talk about privately. At any rate, that's going on. And finally, this allows you to make clean drinking water without electricity. So that's probably useful too. Uh, so the filtration at Irvine, UC Irvine went, developed more and more. As I say, I'm very much experimentalist. I spend a lot of my time doing plumbing. And uh, meanwhile, in 2008, I underwent a transformation myself. Here am I in my ground state on the beach in a Hawaiian shirt. And I got this offer from Hitoshi who specifically said, come to IPMU and make gadolinium work in SuperK, right in the offer letter. <laughs> so that's what I came to do and had to get appropriately attired for the occasion. So anyway, uh, we built this test facility near SuperK. SuperK is here. We have a thing called EGADS. This is a Kavli IPMU ICRR joint venture. It's a 200-ton baby K. This is a graphic you saw yesterday in the slideshow. There's a 200-ton tank. There's the happy people. And there's what this whole facility looks like. This is the magical filtration system that doesn't remove the gadolinium. There's the baby K. We've spent over $20 million so far testing this gadolinium idea, half in Japan and half in America. So it's been quite an endeavor. And we're just about there. There's what the inside of EGADS looks like. It's a baby K, as I say. There's a few Hyper-K tubes here, just for service work. We're helping out Hyper-K. Looking down, event display. This shows that the transparency of the gadolinium loaded water, which are the colored lines here, are within the super-K ultra-pure water uh, transparency range. So whenever we're not fiddling around with the system, which are these bands, we go up into that ultra-pure range. So this proves you can load gadolinium and you can keep the water beautiful and clear. And this line from an atomic absorption spectrometer shows this, the loading of gadolinium. We did it in steps. And then we oscillate around this, this fixed point which is the concentration we were aiming for. So after 500 turnovers of the tank, recirculating, re-recirculating the water, we haven't lost any gadolinium. So it's a lossless system, and it maintains ultra-pure water. So a few months ago, we opened the EGADS tank for the first time in two and a half years to see what it looked like after all this gadolinium business. And uh, there's the big reveal, opening the hatch. This slide was in the uh, slideshow yesterday. 
We looked in, it's beautiful and shiny, you can't really see it there. Here you can see it. You're looking through gadolinium-loaded water here. It's even hard to see the boundary at the surface. But it's beautiful, shiny, no rust, the metal is all gorgeous. So it's, we really do believe that it's, it's the same. So anyway, after all these EGADS tests and other tests, there's been many, many studies, there have been no showstoppers. So back in 2015, the Supergate collaboration agreed to move forward. In 2016, the TDK collaboration, which uses SuperK as the FAR detector, these are both IPMU efforts, uh, they agreed to go forward. And then finally, just a couple of, few months ago, July 26, we have set the fixed point for the draining of SuperK to prepare for this. So we're going to drain the detector, get it all ready for gadolinium. Next summer starts July, June 1st of next year. By the way, here I'll mention that we have never before released, we have never released a photograph of the inside of Super K taken with a smartphone. You've never seen one. You've seen lots of pictures of the inside of Super K. Not one has been taken with a smartphone. And the reason for that is the last time Super K was empty, smartphones didn't exist. It's been full a long time. So we're going to drain it next year. We're getting ready. Here is this new hall for putting in our new water system. This will just quickly show the building of it. Bip, 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 bip. Here it is full of equipment earlier this year. So that's it. That is our timeline. You can see that here's where the gadolinium loading begins in here somewhere. There's some dot, dot, dots where we're not completely sure yet. But at any rate, so three years from today, which is this vertical line here, we should have had gadolinium in at some level, and perhaps the full level, but at some level for sure, for a year, two years. And so we should absolutely have collected some new supernova neutrinos by then. So I think it's really true that three years from now, we will have new supernova neutrinos in hand. So that's it, and I will just finish up with this. We're going to be waiting for the next galactic supernova. It'll be awesome. While we're waiting, we'll be collecting the DSNB neutrinos, and we're going to start the work in 2018, June 1st. And with that, I'm going to bring in the gadolinium and wrap it up. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs>